Hello friends, thanks for joining me. And we're gonna be doing something today that is gonna be the first in a series of these videos that I'm gonna do. And this is adapted from a tasting that I led for the Los Angeles Whiskey Club. So uh, if you're not familiar with them, they are experienced whiskey drinkers, but they were all relatively new to bourbon. And I was asked to start uh, a tasting that would serve as kind of an introduction to, to bourbon for them. And so um, I was dealing with an interesting situation where I had experienced whiskey drinkers with, with developed palates, but they were principally focused on Scotch whiskey or Japanese whiskey, and they, they hadn't gotten into American whiskeys and particularly bourbon as much. And so we had a great night, and thanks very much to them for inviting me to do that. But I realized there could be a lot of other people in this position, whether you're someone uh, in a country that's not the United States, where maybe you haven't had as much access to, to bourbon whiskey, or you could be like myself. So I started getting into whiskey, and I was interested in Scotch whiskey. I was got into Japanese whiskey, and I bourbon for me was just something that you picked up by the handle for parties. It wasn't wasn't something that demanded careful attention and a tasting with notes and all this kind of, you know, the fancy stuff you do for wine or scotch whiskey or what have you. And um, only in recent years did I come around to giving it its, its due consideration. So um, what I'm going to do is talk you through some sense of the historical evolution of bourbon. So I'm going to start all the way back in the 1700s and then carry on to, to today. But uh, I'm going to name some whiskeys as examples. I'm not going to be tasting any whiskey as, as a part of this, but just to give you a sense of if you, if you want to actually connect what I'm talking about to flavors, what, what some good uh, whiskeys to go out and might find would be. Uh, and I've tried to keep this uh, a little bit technical, but not, not overly nerdy. So, um, you know, again, this was designed initially for experienced whiskey drinkers, but um, we're going we're gonna to be talking about some of the jargon associated with bourbon. Um, you know, at the end of, of this series, you're going to know about uh, mash bill, sour mash, sweet mash, bottled and bond, barrel proof, uh, single barrel, some of those, those terms. And again, please seek out some of the bourbons with those contours if you want to, if you want to actually taste uh, what this means in practice. So, um, if you guys have any questions about this, or if I've, if I've said something incorrect and, and require correction, um, it's, uh, please reach out to me. I'm happy to, happy to answer questions or, or have, uh, have a discussion about this, but, um, you know, to, to me, the, the questions I started asking myself when I started getting into bourbon are, why, why is it done this way? Why are, why are these practices the way they are in terms of, of the various processes that go into making bourbon? And bourbon is both highly regulated and it's also steeped in tradition. So because of that, the answer to the, that question of why is it done this way is usually uh, either because the law says so or because it's always been done that way. And, you know, then I, I always I always like to go back to first principles when I'm doing stuff like this and, and think about why do we have bourbon or why do we have whiskey generally? And, and the answer is that whiskey is a way for a farmer to take a grain that they grow and to turn it into something that's not perishable, that can be easily transported and sold or more easily transported and sold than, than raw grain. And so you had immigrants from countries with distilling traditions like Scotland and Ireland and Germany. Um, they start moving to the, the U.S. in the 18th century and... Uh, began migrating west in the mid to late 1700s, and as they did so, they brought their distilling knowledge along with them. Uh, and because whiskey is something that can be sold to produce income, it is of great interest to the government, specifically the taxman. So it's the regulation of the production and labeling of bourbon imposed by the government uh, in the interest of, of collecting taxes that shapes so much of what ends up in our bottle to this very day. And uh, indeed, bourbon exists principally as a legal term given to us by the U.S. Treasury. So that gets to this, this question of what is bourbon. And according to the Treasury's Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, known affectionately as the TTB, bourbon whiskey is an alcoholic distillate from a fermented mash of not less than 51% corn, uh, not exceeding 160 proof off the stills, stored at not more than 125 proof in charred new oak containers, and then bottled at not less than 80 proof. So uh, if you store it in those new oak containers for two years or more, you can call it straight whiskey. And that distinction was created in order to differentiate it from unaged whiskey or whiskey blended with neutral, grain neutral spirit. So um, also, if, if straight whiskey is aged less than four years, by law, it must have an age statement on the label. So all of the whiskey that we're going to be talking about is straight bourbon whiskey. But um, I'd like you to think about, you know, as, as you try some of these whiskeys, just the incredible diversity of aromas and flavors that we, we can derive from these same raw material inputs in this, in this very prescribed process. Um, 
another thing is that you will notice that nowhere in my, my prior commentary did I mention Kentucky. So there's a popular misconception that bourbon can only be produced in Kentucky. Uh, in fact, it, it can be produced in any of the 50 states so long as it corresponds to those rules. So you ferment a mash of at least 51% corn, you distill it uh, to under 80% ABV, dilute it down to at least 62.5% ABV, mature it in new chart oak, bottle it above 40%, and voila, you have bourbon. Uh, so the first whiskey I would like to highlight is bottled and bond whiskey. So this is another term that is given to us by, by the U.S. government, and it's got a fascinating history. So back in the early 1800s, bourbon used to be sold wholesale in actual barrels. So these, these barrels were put on boats, and they were shipped down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers to New Orleans. And then you had middlemen who were called rectifiers, and these were the ones that, that were actually bottling that bourbon or selling it to the consumer. So in a lot of cases, they would add water to stretch the whiskey, or they'd add other things to change the color and the flavor and the texture. And these could be as innocuous as prune juice, or they could be as disgusting as emptying a spittoon of chewing tobacco spit into the whiskey to really thicken it up and give it that, that dark kind of reddish color. But the end result was that the consumer in a lot of cases was getting subpar products. So in order to remedy this, Congress passed the Bottled and Bond Act of 1897, and it provided a legal framework for distilleries to bottle a product under government supervision uh, that was guaranteed to be of a certain quality and also had some favorable tax treatment. So you were able to defer the payment of taxes until the bourbon was mature and you were ready to sell it. So getting into the specifics of, of what this means, to be labeled as bottled in bond or bonded whiskey, the liquor must be the product of one distillation season. So there's, there's two distillation seasons, uh, traditionally January to June or July to December. Uh, but it has to be the product of one season by one distiller at one distillery. And it must have been aged in a federally bonded warehouse under U.S. government supervision for at least four years. So there's a, a guarantee of a minimum age on this. And it has to be bottled at 100 proof or 50% ABV. And uh, we get some, some stipulation about labeling as well, which is nice for those of us that care about the details. So the, the bottled products labels must identify the distillery where it was distilled and if it was bottled somewhere else where it was bottled. So uh, originally they need to seal this with a tax stamp as well, but um, they've, you've, you've dispensed with that in recent years, although you still do see the, the decorative tax stamp on the, on the top of some of these bottles as a, as a kind of a nod uh, to the historical uh, presentation of this whiskey. But the, the net effect of all this and why we care was that the government got to keep their eye on all this whiskey to make sure that none went missing, the distilleries got to defer taxes for four years, and consumers got a product that had some guarantee of quality. So <laughs> happy times all around. And though times have changed, this designation and the whiskeys bottled under this regime remain so to this day. And as a consumer, if you know nothing else about whiskey, you know you can go into a store and buy a bottle and bond whiskey, and you'll probably be getting something with, with decent quality and flavors. So uh, some of the ones that I like to pick out are... Um, there are a number of great bottled and bond whiskeys from um, Jim Beam portfolio. There's Jim Beam bottled and bond. Old Tub is one that they recently uh, brought out. Um, you can get some from Buffalo Trace that are, are increasingly rare. So E.H. Taylor, named for E.H. Taylor, one of the, the uh, primary proponents of the bottled and bond act. Um, but a one that I really recommend people start out with is a whiskey from the Heaven Hill Distillery in Bardstown, Kentucky. And um, this is the Evan Williams bottled and bond. So uh, Heaven Hill will tell you that Evan Williams was Kentucky's first distiller. And there's a, there's a technical bourbon term for that, which is BS. Um, but this is another thing that I, I hope you guys come away with from the series of videos is there's, there's bourbon is so full of stories and mythologizing and just plain old lies. And it, it always pays to do your own independent research as to the who, where, how and what behind the liquid that ends up in the bottle. And if you've read my reviews on Malt Review, that's www.malt-review.com, you'll realize that like so much of my time is just spent saying, okay, take the claim from the distillery. Okay, well, is that true? Is that true? Is that true? Can I verify that? So um, going back to the Evan Williams bottle and bond, the label on that says uh, 1783, but the Heaven Hill Distillery actually started in 1935. Uh, the Shapiro family provided the capital and members of the Beam family, interesting, uh, of Jim Beam fame have uh, worked for them as distillers. So uh, Parker Beam, most notably in, in recent years, he's, he's since passed, but a uh, legendary master distiller. Um, and you're probably familiar with some of the brands in their portfolio. So Elijah Craig, uh, Old Fitzgerald is owned by Heaven Hill as well. But the thing I like about 
the Heaven Hill Distillery is that they produce a high quality of whiskey at all price points. So they got some bottles up in the multiple hundreds of dollars range, but there's also Evan Williams Belden Bond, which is under 20 bucks typically. You know, I can I can find a fifth of this for 17 bucks. If you want to upsize to the 1.75 liter handle, you you know you can pay 30 bucks. But it's it's an incredible value. It's my everyday go-to bourbon. It is the backbone of of my house Manhattan cocktail. And um, again, it's Bottled and Bond, uh, legally stipulated 50% ABV, uh, coming at you for no less than, than four years. And it's just, it's just a nice, solid representation of um, this distillery, of this category, and why, why do we care about Bottled and Bond. So if you can find it, and you should be able to find it, please uh, have a taste of Evan Williams' Bottled and Bond and uh, let me know what you think. But that concludes the first uh, segment of this. I'm going to be carrying on next we're going to be talking about uh, single barrels and, you know, more particularly the Four Roses single barrel. So if you enjoyed this and found it at all educational, then uh, tune in for the next iteration of this, this series. But as always, thanks for the time. Thanks for the attention. Been fun uh, rocking with you guys for a few minutes and chatting whiskey. So we'll do that again soon. So yeah, cheers. <laughs>